As Pastor John uh, already uh, alluded, we have our, a special speaker this morning. Uh, it's, it is a blessing to have uh, Pastor Kevin Akana and his uh, wife uh, with us this morning, all the way from the state of Hawaii. And uh, we, um, we actually um, met them uh, quite a few years ago because their daughter started uh, dating uh, one of our uh, college students, Fabian Vasquez, at their Bible college. And then, of course, they got married. And I have no idea to this day how Fabian convinced Kylie to move from Hawaii here, um, but uh, he did somehow. And, uh, and so they're, of course, down here, and uh, Pastor O'Connor came to uh, visit them. And, uh, and so while he was in town uh, last year, uh, I think it was really the first time we got to actually sit and talk. And uh, he had come by uh, quickly uh, the, um, several years uh, in a row, but uh, last year uh, it was a great time. They were helping Kylie and Fabian move into their new place, and uh, so we got to spend a lot of time uh, together, and, uh, and so I told Pastor Khan, I said, next time you come down, I really want you to preach at our church, and uh, he was very gracious to say yes, and, uh, but we've had a good time uh, every time he's come. Uh, I think on Friday night, we, we had him over to the house, and, um, and most of y'all know I'm a talker. Pastor Kana, he also is a talker, and we, man, we were, we were talking Bible, we were talking about eschatology, we were talking about every doctrine in the Bible till about a little past midnight, and it was great. And uh, I, I've just enjoyed his company. I've enjoyed uh, his friendship, and uh, and I really um, I just enjoyed uh, having uh, being able to get to, to know them a little bit better. And uh, and so, Pastor Connor, it is it is a blessing to have you with us this morning. And I'm going to ask if you would come and uh, share whatever the Lord has laid on your heart. Let's welcome him this morning to Bethany Baptist Church. I just want to say that we came here to try to convince Kylie to come back to Hawaii. <laughs> but anyway, there's a church in uh, Texas City that asked us to come and do a missions conference, and so we'd ask them if it had been okay as they flew us up to, um, to Texas if we could stop by and see, see our daughter. So that was a blessing to be able to come by. I appreciate um, Pastor Jeremy and Rochelle having us over and all the hospitality. Because we're coming by to, to see Kylie, and he has um, offered to put us up. And we just appreciate the hospitality. And it's just a blessing to be here. The last time we were here, you know, I could, when we left, you know, you go through airports, and for some reason the airports, I don't know why, they can be so unfriendly. <laughs> and even when I think when we left Hawaii over there, at the airport, you know, you figure the aloha spirit, but. They were so unfriendly. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I was going to ask them, but I thought, don't be rude. I was going to ask them, do you get paid like a bonus for being mean? I mean, I thought. But when we came here and we left here, man, you know, we're standing in line. And at that time, you had the fires in Lahaina. And so somebody, when I showed them my ID, they said, oh, you're from Hawaii. And they asked, started asking questions about that. And we started talking, and they were just very hospitable. There was a line of people, and they the person just kept talking. I says, you know, over here, Rock, I call my wife, her, her name's Roxanne, I call her Rock. I says, you know, Rock, over here, the people are so friendly. You know, they're just down to earth and real friendly. I mean, I wish I could speak Spanish because everyone's speaking to me in Spanish. But um, I can see why Kylie loves being here, you know, because just it's the, the people. You can feel it, the, the humbleness and the friendliness. And, and I feel that way here at the church, so I appreciate that. And it was a blessing to be here. All right, turn your Bibles to Matthew. You know, as, as your pastor mentioned, that I'm a talker. And yes, in fact, Roxanne was saying, man, you just, you know, I mean, not she wouldn't say you wouldn't shut up, but you just kept talking. And, talking. and you forget, you know, because our kids are grown. They have still kids. And there was a missionary family where there were kids. And she was saying, she was trying to like, come on. <laughs> but... I told her, I said, man, Rock, I just could not stop talking. But um, we just had, we enjoyed the fellowship they was able to have. So I keep telling myself, okay, you're not at home. Don't preach forever. <laughs> keep telling myself, keep it short, keep it short. So we'll try it. Matthew chapter 9. Now as we look at this chapter, 
I want to talk about a particular individual this morning, but as we go through it, I'm normally expository, you know, so I'll just kind of go through the part where I want to emphasize, and then we'll see how that goes. The first thing I want to talk about is, is Matthew. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful to be here, and what an honor, what a privilege to be in this church, and just to the great singing we heard this morning, as I was mentioning to, to Roxanne, just as the music here is just off the charts, what a blessing to, to hear it and to be in a service like this. It, I believe that just being together as with God's people singing is a preview of what heaven is going to be like in a lot of ways, and we're thankful for, for that. And I pray now as we look at your word, I pray you'd help me to preach and teach your word, Lord. I pray that I could be a blessing as everyone has been such a blessing to us. And I'm just thankful for our daughter being in a great church. Thankful for husband Fabian and his family. And just to be here is, is a blessing and a privilege and an honor. I pray that you'd help me, Lord, to say the things that you want to be said. And I pray, Lord, that, that as we look at your word, that you would conform us into your image. And we just... We are so thankful that you've given us your word because we know how much we need it and to be reminded of some things at times. As we look at this person, Matthew, who wrote this book, the book of Matthew, and I just pray that we could learn some things about him. But most importantly, that we learn more about you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for all that you have done. And we thank you for most of all for salvation. And we lift you up, Lord Jesus, as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we thank you for dying on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in Matthew 9, as it's this, the book of Matthew, in this section of it, you know, I've entitled it when I was preaching through Matthew, the power of the king is, you know, you see he's introduced, you know, and Matthew is, is writing this book primarily to the, to the uh, Jewish audience, showing that Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. And, and we see that his genealogy, you know, we see the opposition Herod and all that in the first couple of chapters. And we see the Sermon on the Mount, which is the constitution of the kingdom, basically, how we're supposed to live, but we fall short. But Jesus, he's the one. He lives it. And the closer we walk to Jesus, the more that we'll live like that. And then you see in, in chapters 8 and 9, the power of the king as he's able to do the things that he speaks of. And you see the miracles that he does. And what's interesting is because Jesus is presented as the king of the Jews, he's showing the Jews that the kingdom that is being presented is a, a lot bigger than what they're thinking of. Because the Jews felt like everything revolved around them and that the kingdom was just for them. And they felt like Gentiles, a lot of them at that time of Jesus, Jesus' day, there was so much uh, racial tension and they felt like the Gentiles, basically God created them to fuel the fires of hell. And so that was their mindset. There was a lot of opposition, of course, to the Samaritans, which were considered half Jews. And so right away, Matthew is he's bringing up some miracles that Jesus did, not just because these are the ones that were first done. It's not necessarily in chronological order, but he's bringing these miracles to light because they included people that the Jews felt like were castaways or those that they were rejected and you see the uh, the leprous man who was healed you know they had to stay at, at a distance and women also were looked down upon in, in those days in fact there was a prayer that the jews would pray and they would, the, the orthodox jews would pray in the morning saying that they would thank god that they weren't a gentile and that they would thank god that they weren't a dog because dogs were despised animals scavengers and then they would even pray that they would thank God they weren't a woman. That was the mindset. And a woman's testimony wasn't even valid in, in a court of a law. And so you see that the, the miracles that were done was a leprous man was healed. We see that Peter's mother-in-law, she was sick and she was healed. We see a Gentile, and not just a Gentile, but a centurion who was basically worked for the Romans, who was their enemy. So it was Gentile, that's bad a Roman, that's bad, and then a military leader, it's just like the worst of the worst for them to look down upon somebody, and yet Jesus heals the centurion's servant. So he is doing these miracles for people that were considered to be the rejects. And Matthew is trying to say that the kingdom that Jesus is presenting is far bigger 
than what they were expecting. His kingdom included a lot more people than they thought. Those that they thought were rejects, Jesus accepts and says that Matthew's presenting that he is the king of the world. And everyone is invited to be a part of that. So in this part of the story, we see that it continues on. The power of the king is presented in verse 1. He enters into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy. And then, of course, here's a paralyzed individual lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Of course, we know the story that his friends lowered him through the roof. And they did that because they wanted him to be healed. And when, of course, Jesus says, Son, your sins be forgiven thee. That's not what they wanted to hear. They wanted him to be healed. That was what they wanted. But it could be that this individual had guilt. Some say that as far as traditionally, he was sick because of a a particular sin that he committed. And it hurt him physically. And it could have been like a venereal disease or something along those lines. And so it could be that he was concerned about that. Or maybe it's just that Jesus said this because Jesus knows his biggest need is not to be healed physically, it's to be forgiven. Man's greatest need is forgiveness, and Jesus' greatest deed is to forgive. So he he says that. And then it says, And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, that already tells us that Jesus is God, for he knows their thoughts, said, Whatever think ye evil in your hearts, For whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk. He said, what's easier for me to say, your sins be forgiven, or arise and walk? Now we might think that, I mean, of course the people that were there might have thought, to see someone rise up and walk, that's difficult. But Jesus is saying, for me to say to this man to rise up and walk, and for him to walk, that's easy. He just says the word. But for his sins to be forgiven, Jesus has to die on the cross. So that is a lot harder. And sometimes I think we don't realize the miraculous work of Jesus Christ when someone gets saved. And so he tells them to rise up and walk. But he says, just so you know, in verse 6, but that you know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, go into thy house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which hath given such power unto men. He says, just so you know that I have the power to forgive sins, he tells them to rise up and walk. Do you know how people know that we have been forgiven? By our walk. He had a different walk from that day on. He was able to walk. And just like us, we're able to walk the path of life that God intends for us after we have received forgiveness. So that would be the, I guess you could say, the introduction into the part that I want to talk about today. So it says, He arose, departed to his house, but when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Verse 9, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. So we're introduced to a man, and he says that his name is Matthew. And you know that his name was Levi? His name was Levi. Which means, I mean, it's just like, we have a grandson. His name is August. He's named after his grandfather, his other grandfather, whose name is August. And you know if someone's name is August, they're born in August. <laughs> I remember when he talks about when he, when he met uh, the person he ended up marrying, and um, he introduced himself, and then the next question, of course, is when is your, when, when is your birthday? And he tells the, um, this girl, this lady, oh, guess which month my birthday's in? And she guessed wrong. <laughs> I don't know, October. No, it's August, after my name. Oh, makes sense. And so our grandson, obviously, he was born on August the 1st, and I honestly didn't want him to be named August, but they said if he's born in August, 
he's going to be named August. So I was like, I was hoping he was going to be born a little earlier so he could have choose a different name, like maybe Kevin or something. <laughs> but he was born on August the 1st. I mean, it was close, but he got, so he got the name August. So here's a guy named Levi. You know, he is from the tribe of Levi. And those that were from the tribe of Levi, they were the Levites. They made up the priestly class. I don't know if he was a descendant of Aaron, but that was a prominent tribe. I mean, they served at the temple. They were very, very religious. And so here, to have someone who became a tax collector that was from the tribe of Levi was a double negative. Not only is he a Jew, but he is a Levite. And not only does he work for the Romans, but he became a tax collector. You know how in our culture, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but in our culture a lot of times those that are, are politicians or even those that are um, lawyers sometimes are looked down upon. You ever heard the joke, what's the difference between a dead dog lying in the road and a dead attorney? Is there skid marks in front of the dog? <laughs> so you know that Sometimes, you know, we make jokes about certain groups of people. They had that for tax collectors. And in those days, the tax collectors were looked down upon, and probably even in our day. So for him to be a Levite and to be a Jew, a Levite, to become a tax collector was something that you as a parent would never say, hey, my son, he's a tax collector. You would not brag about that. In fact, a lot of times they got, I mean, disowned. When they became, they, they were viewed as to be traitors. So here you have Matthew. Now, we mostly know him as Matthew, and he probably intended for that to be. He didn't say, hey, hi, my, you know, as a tax collector, right? So his name was Matthew, known as, but his name is Levi. You know, how we know some of the disciples have two different names. And so here he is, it says, Jesus walks past him. It says, he come forth, he saw a man in verse 9 named Matthew sitting at receipt of custom. So here you have this tax collector. That was his occupation. Now, they were looked down upon for various reasons because they were viewed as being traitors to their own country and also because they were ripoff artists, basically. So what Rome would do, they would have a certain area and people that were good with numbers, accountants, they would basically know, and they would, you know, just like someone who's an actuary, they, they're good with numbers, they know the percentages. and So they were able to figure out how much that they could get out of this area as far as taxing the people. And then they would bid. And so Rome would basically pick the highest bidder. But you didn't want to bid too high because it's going to be hard for you to get that much money. So you had to really be sharp. So the tax collectors, they were very sharp because they would bid for that area. And so then when the different people would bid for the, obviously Rome would pick the highest bidder and then you're required to collect that money for Rome. And Rome, you know, they would, they would expect that. So you had to get that amount of money. Anything above that, you pocket it. And it's obvious when you know that somebody is wealthy. Like in our community, we live in a, a I guess you could say kind of a rural community. There's not a lot of rich people. Of course, you practically have to be rich to live in Hawaii. I mean, if you've ever. <laughs> but there are certain things that you would look at someone and you know that they, it may, they may not be, but they may be wealthy. In the car you drive, where you live, the type of house you live, the, how you dress. Certain, there's certain clothing that is, I mean, you know, some of those, you ever see those uh, um, expensive handbags? In Hawaii, they sell a lot of them. I'm not sure exactly why, but a lot of the Japanese tourists come there to buy them there because the tax, they don't, they're not taxed a certain way or whatever. And so a lot of the shops have just that. Because I was thinking one time, why do we, who buys these? <laughs> you go in there, a little bag like this costs $500. A little bit bigger, it costs like twelve, fifteen hundred. dollars <laughs> I don't get it. But if somebody has a lot of these things, you could think that either you know, they collect them or they get them at a cheap price, or maybe they stole them, or they're rich. And people knew Matthew was very wealthy. 
So if you look at a tax collector, you already look down upon him, and then he's driving a nice car or whatever it is how they got around or whatever was a determining factor in his day. They knew that this guy was ripping us off. He's wealthy. He's not just getting the, the amount that, that Rome needs and just enough to live. I mean, he's living, like in our area, it would be Haiku Plantation, a very expensive subdivision. He lived in Haiku Plantation. He had like three, four Lexus cars. You know, Lexus is at least considered to be kind of rich cars over there or Cadillac or whatever. They knew he was rich, so that made it even worse for them. They didn't like this guy. And so if you're a tax collector, you didn't have that many friends. But the friends that you did have were other tax collectors, <laughs> Or those that you, or people that were able to get money from you. And so, prostitutes. Those would be the people that, you, that knew you or gave you attention. Maybe they weren't true friends. but So that's kind of the people he associated with. A lot of times, their family wouldn't even talk to them. They were ashamed of the fact that they were tax collectors. So you see, you got this guy named Matthew, and you see that he was a tax collector. And in those days, they taxed everything. The tax collectors are trying to make it, you know, reasons why to tax you. So they would tax the food that was in your house. They tax it when it left your house. They tax it when it went on the wagon and how big your, your, uh, uh, the, the, the wheels on your, on your vehicle were to transport them. Everything was taxed. I mean, they taxed literally everything, kind of like today. <laughs> I know you're looking at them, thinking, man, we're taxing the money we make, we're taxing the money we spent, we're taxing the house we buy, we're taxing the property tax, we're taxing the, you know, I mean, it's literally everything. You buy, you buy food, you got to pay, at least in Hawaii, I don't know if here if you have to pay tax on food. And it's just crazy the tax you pay. You, you got to pay, a, you know, you, even when you die, you have to pay a tax. I mean, you can't even die free, you know. And so it was like that then, but it was even worse. It was bad. The people were oppressed. And you know when you're oppressed, you look at certain people that you feel is part of the reason you're treated that way, and then you despise them. So here you have Matthew. He was a despised person. And he probably didn't have too many people come by and say, hey, how are you doing, Matthew? Good to see you. Hope you're having a good day. He didn't, have, he didn't get too much of that. I mean, he, when he came around, people were kind of just, what is he going to do? He's probably going to try and tax us more. And so when Jesus says this to him, it took him back a little bit. Look what it says. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, follow me. He said, follow me. And so Matthew followed him. It says he arose and followed him. That was something for Matthew being a tax collector. When he, when he decided to follow Jesus, that was a big switch. And you know, when, when we get to Matthew 10, you see the disciples, the apostles. They're first called apostles in chapter 10 in the book of Matthew. And you see their names listed out. And one of them is a zealot. And a zealot is one that they were like the militia. Or you could say like Antifa. You know, they were the ones who want to troll, uh, over, overthrow sus, uh, those that are governing them in society. The zealots were trying to overthrow Rome. And they would do it, you know, in their militias, violently. So can you imagine when Jesus has his followers and one of them is a tax collector and the other one is a zealot? <laughs> and even the fishermen, even the fish were taxed, highly taxed. The fish that they caught from the, the Sea of Galilee. It was the, and so the fishermen, they wouldn't have liked Matthew. In fact, no one there would have liked Matthew. They probably questioned Jesus. Uh, what's he doing here? Oh, he's one of the, he, he's following me. Jesus, do you know that he's a tax collector? <laughs> Jesus knew this. But Jesus put together a diverse group of followers. And I'm sure here we have a, you know, a diverse group. I know in our church is a diverse group. And only the love of Jesus could put people together that are from different backgrounds, different intellect. In our, in, in our community, it would be like different public schools you came from because there's always a competition between schools. And so you have all, and Jesus puts them together, and we are one in Christ. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that's what you see among the disciples. So we see that his occupation is a tax collector. 
He was presented an option, follow me. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. So he had that option. He could have stayed a tax collector. He could have made a lot of money financially. But he chose to follow Jesus. And obviously, those in this room, you've chosen to follow Jesus. And you made the right choice. We're to, uh, I believe one of the songs was a call for to follow the king. And when we follow him, he will make us to be fishers of men. So, as we continue on the story, it says, verse 10, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, when we read Luke's gospel, and Luke chapter 5 tells us that this is Matthew's house. So what did Matthew do? He had an opportunity. So he decided, you know, my friends need to meet Jesus. And so he has a party because he's got money. He probably has a huge house. He probably has a huge room that would allow to have a, a lot of people there. So he uses his resources to have a party to introduce his friends to Jesus Christ. And who was at this party? Tax collectors. Who was at this party? It was prostitutes. And he had this party to introduce them to Jesus Christ. And I believe all of us have opportunities. We may not have the means that he had. Some people may not have a pers- the personality that somebody else has. Someone else, I was commenting to, to my wife that the, the singing is like, the singers on just the beautiful voices. Not everyone has that kind of a, a, a voice, but those that do use it because that's an opportunity to serve. We all have opportunity. You have opportunities in the church. God, of course, calls and equips people in a different way, but everybody has an opportunity. And I think the church, in some ways, generally speaking, is failing because we don't take those opportunities or we don't think that we have the same opportunity someone else has. But we all have opportunities. We've got to figure out what it is that we can do. Hopefully you're aware of what your spiritual gift is. Use it in the church to be a blessing. Because it is a blessing you know, when, you are, when you're in church and people are using their gifts. And also we could use our gifts to win people to Christ. And working together as a, as a church with a diverse group of people. But following the master, we could see people saved. And so he uses his opportunity. What was that? He got everybody together, and he had a party. And during this party, he introduces them to Jesus Christ. We could get creative. You could say, you know what? I'm going to invite some of the people from, from my job or in the neighborhood or in the family or in the community. I'm going to bring some people from the church so I have a good balance of Christians there. I'm going to bring them to my house. We're going to watch a, a big game. And at halftime, we're going to have a devotion. You say, well, they're not going to really like that. Well, there are... You invited them to your house. You fed them. Now it's, it's halftime. They're not going to leave because they want to see the rest of the game. Perfect timing. That's an opportunity. You say, well, I just don't know if I can invite people over. I don't really have the house that, that can accompany or it's not adequate or whatever. Well, ask them, hey, can, can I buy you lunch? And they might think, hmm, must be a multi-level marketing thing. But Then they, you invite them to lunch, and it's not a multi-level marketing thing. You want to just show them how to be saved, and they'll be, oh, they'll be happy that it's not multi-level marketing, and you're showing them how to, and then they will get saved maybe. There's things that we can do. And I think what happens sometimes is we think, well, that's the pastor's job. That's the minister's job. That's the full-time Christian's job. That's those that have the gift of evangelism. No, it is all our job. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So he had that opportunity. I want to encourage all of us, take those opportunities that presents itself, and they will come to us. And take those opportunities. And also, don't fall into this trap. Don't think that it is our job to invite people to church. I mean, that's good. That's good. I'm not saying not to do that. But that's not our job. Our job is to show them how to be saved. Well, bring them to church and they can get saved. And, that they, and that's good too. Sometimes if that's, maybe it's hard for you, or you, they won't listen to you, or you try it, or whatever, Bring them to church because chances are the gospel will be presented and they can get saved. But don't think it is our job to bring people to church. It's to bring them to Christ. 
And you say, I just don't know how to witness. You better figure that one out quick. Give them your testimony. Tell them what happened to you. I'm, I'm sure Matthew stood up and said, oh, everybody, you know me, I'm a tax collector, I'm very successful, one of the top tax collectors, this and that, but I'm going to follow Jesus now. I met Jesus, and you need to meet him too. You know, and he, you know just the, the woman at the well, what did she do? She just told people, she just said, this man told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Messiah? Is not this the Christ? And a whole city was converted as a result of her initial uh, testimony. And then, of course, they came and they heard Jesus themselves. And so the blind man, you know, he said, I don't know everything about this man. But one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. Give them your testimony. And then the more you do it, the more you witness, the better you'll get. And the Bible says, be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you the reason of the hope which is in you with meekness and fear. So he took the opportunity. Then the next thing, obviously, you're going to have opposition. When you serve the Lord, you have opposition. You try to bring people to Christ, you have opposition. When you have opposition, take note, you're doing something right. <laughs> Because the devil is not going to try to stop those that are not doing anything for God. So if you're doing something for the Lord and you have opposition, that's a good sign. And if the church is attacked, that's a good sign, knowing that the church is a threat to the devil and his cause. He is not going to just let it go. He's going to attack. So we pray, pray, and put on the armor of God. So uh, opposition. So in verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw it, that he was eating with publicans and sinners, they say unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? So you have people that started to criticize. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. There's three times Jesus said to learn something. Here, learn what that meaneth about mercy. He says learn that. We as Christians should be merciful because we have received mercy. Second thing he says, learn of me. We need to learn of Jesus. And then the third thing, is he says, learn about Israel, because all prophecy is centered around the nation of Israel. So learn those things. So the last thing I want to I want to say here, and then I'm finished. So you first you see his occupation. Everyone has a different occupation or what it is you do, and God calls us to leave that occupation in a sense of understanding. I'm not here to be that. I'm here to serve Jesus. Whatever. If you're a, a business person. You got to do the business to support yourself, but primarily we are here as Christians to serve the master. So he had his occupation. He had that option to follow Jesus or not. He chose Jesus. He had opportunities because of the person that he is and his background, whether it's intellect, personality, family relations, those that the neighbors, neighborhood you're in. What, there's opportunities all over the place. Then you can, there's going to be opposition. And then this last thing I want to look at, it's very interesting. When you look at Matthew's gospel, or Luke's gospel, it's a little different, this story. Look at Luke 5 and verse 27. Luke is explaining this, Dr. Luke. Luke 5, verse 27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi. That's Matthew, right? Sitting at the custom, receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. Verse 28. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. Matthew didn't say that. Matthew says about himself, Jesus said, Follow me, and he followed him. Luke says, Oh, Matthew. He left out a detail. He left all. You see, Andrew, Peter, James, and John were fishermen. 
they could always go back. In fact, remember when Peter said, I go a fishing? They always could fall back on fishing if they wanted to, technically. I mean, at that point, that was the last time Peter went fishing. But he said, hey, I go fishing. I'm going to go back to what I always did. There was no way Matthew could ever go back to being a publican, to being a tax. When he followed Jesus, that was it. He cut all ties of his former life. He will never have that opportunity again. He was done with that. Whether he wanted to or not, if he changes my later on, you are not coming back. When he followed Jesus, he left all. And we have to get that into our mind. If we're going to follow the Lord, it's going to cost us. This was his offering. You know, Jesus gave his all for us, and he says that we're supposed to, it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Matthew, his offering, he offered up himself. Like the person that didn't have any money when the offering came around, and he just said, you know what, I'll give myself. That's what Jesus wants. He wants us. That's his offering. And it says here, in verse 29, And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. Matthew didn't say that. He just said that there was a party. But, but Luke says this was Levi's house. He's the one who did it. That was his offering. He offered up himself and everything he was about. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with him. So, if we're going to serve the Lord, we have to serve the Lord with ourselves to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice. Just like when Jesus offered that, I was talking to the pastor about the Last Supper, when Jesus, when, when he said to them to, to um, partake of the Lord's Supper, to drink the wine that represents his blood. In a wedding, when the bride was offered that, the bridegroom is saying, I offer you all that I am, everything that I am, I give it to you and offer it to you. I offer you my life. And when she takes it and drinks, she says, I accept. And I also offer you everything I am. And so that is the connection when we receive Christ. He gave us his all. And he asks us, for us, to give ourselves, our all, to him. And that's what Matthew did. And Matthew, of course, did it necessarily. I mean, he left all. But he still was able to use all what he was. Because as a publican, he left everything. But he still took his pen. And he writes the book of Matthew. Which is probably one of the greatest accounts of the life of Jesus. Spelled out by someone who knew how to take those detailed facts. Because he was an accountant. And the Lord could use everything that we are. And use it for his honor and his glory. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? With heads bowed and eyes closed. The most important thing is that you have received Jesus Christ. And if you've received Jesus Christ, you say, I've received Jesus as a testimony. Would you just raise your hand? Say, yes, I've received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. Praise the Lord. And if you've never have, today let one of the ministers know and say, you know, I'm interested in hearing how I could receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's the most important thing you could ever do. And those of us who are believers, we should say to Jesus, I am willing. And I'm sure you have. And sometimes it's a daily, it's a daily routine where we let Jesus know, I am yours. Use me today to do what you want me to do. And the Lord will use all of us in spite of ourselves. Thank you. God bless you.